um, from Joel Hansen. There we go. I got that. So welcome, everybody. Uh, just the recording kicked on here. Uh, Steve here. Um, in addition to tonight's presentation, you're going to see a written commentary from uh, Joel Hansen. He puts together every quarter. Joel's going to talk about what went right for the uh, first half and then, of course, what we're looking for uh, for the second half. So appreciate Mike and the team for putting this presentation together as well as Joel supplementing that with uh, written commentary. And what I will say to everyone is, well, we as a team don't get everything right all the time. Uh, what I'm especially proud of is that we get far more things right than wrong, which is the key to success uh, in this investing business. And when we do get things wrong, we're quick to pivot to something else. Uh, so it helps all of us get the gains that you've seen uh, the first half of this year. So uh, super proud of that. Uh, with that, thanks again to Mike and the team for putting this together. And Mike, back over to you. All right. I assume everybody can see my screen. I'm going to start going through that. So standard disclaimer, this is a financial education presentation. You must do your own due diligence on anything heard here. Um, more disclaimer information can be found on anchorstarwealth.com and the opinions expressed are mine and Steve's alone. All right, you can see the team and you know what we do for you. I thought this would be a good time to review that. Make you as much money as possible within your risk tolerance and capacity. And I think it's important to always realize that, you know, we are going to stay compliant within that. And, you know, when we see, oh, market's up 15 percent, but my portfolio's maybe up 10, it has to be within the right risk uh, tolerance. So you might not be 100 percent in the stock market. Um, and depending on what that tolerance is, um, you know, we have it set up appropriately. Um, another thing is just working with any of your partners, your estate planning, tax planning, financial, we want to do good by you. So uh, this screen is new and I, I like this this uh, slide and it shows that, you know, we're not Anchor Star Wealth just by ourselves. We have a lot of partners. The inner circle there are partners like Charles Schwab, First Trust, JP Morgan Chase, um, a couple that aren't listed on there, but these are people that we work with uh, every day or investments that we work with every day. On the outer side, you may recognize Apple, Google, Amazon, Bitcoin, um, Intuitive Surgical. These are different investments we have. Now, I'm, I'm not on the phone with uh, the CEO, Tim Cook, every day or anything, but certainly these are investments that we follow. So I just think it's important to see the overall scope of where we are working. Okay, as far as within our managed accounts within Schwab, uh, in this first this last three months, it is up 8%. About half of that is due to capital appreciation. A little piece is due to income as far as dividends. Um, and then another 40%, uh, I would say, is due to new net contributions. So overall, the portfolio is up 5.26 million, which is 8%. And if you have any questions as we go through this, please put them in the chat and Steve will catch them all and we'll make sure we hit them at the end. As far as overall book of business assets under advisement, we're at 86 million. And I know that uh, you know some questions may be when will we do our SEC registration? That happens uh, between, once you hit a threshold of 90 million um, up into 110 when it's mandatory. So you can see a lot of the different investments that we use. Uh, we tend to be stocks and ETFs. There are some mutual funds that end up in our book, but usually that's because of transfers and we don't want to sell them uh, due to the tax position. So uh, the majority of our positions are stocks and ETFs and bonds. Okay, 2024, what's going well and what we got right? I love it. No recession. Uh, you know, the recession was greatly predicted for 2023 and the recession was continued to be predicted for 2024. And, you know, if we thought we were going into a recession, we'd go totally into safety or, or, or quite a bit. Uh, we did not do that. And that's paid off well. So we've done well. Our top four positions, uh, Apple, Bitcoin, Amazon, Google, all aggressive offensive positions. Our next five are all defensive positions. And, and I'll kind of talk uh, specifically to a few of them because you're going to see them increase in our book uh, in the latter half of this year. 
Um, big news with Apple was obviously at the end of the first quarter, the concern is, is Apple going to have their AI come out? Where's that stand? Is it time to sell Apple? I'm glad we did. Uh, it's up quite a bit. I, I want to say it's up eight. Well, it's up 8% over its high, but back then it was trading about $170 a share and it's, you know, 216. So uh, almost a 25% gain. So great on that. Bitcoin has traded very flat the second quarter. Um, Amazon, Google up uh, nicely. And then let's get into the defensive positions. USFR is a treasury fund that pays about 5.39%. That's, that's very safe. That's as close to cash as we would have. Uh, VCLT is a bond fund. Buffer, B-U-F-R, and JEPI, J-E-P-I. These are what I would call S&P 500 with guardrails. So these are you know, not aggressive positions. They will follow a muted S&P uh, strategy generating income. And when you want to move to safety, these are good funds to be in. And then HYLS is a high yield bond fund. So these are some of the positions that we're in. We got offense, we have defense, and it's it's and obviously there's a lot of other positions you don't see on our top ten. But each portfolio, each bottle is balanced uh, for these for risk. Uh, you can see overall the S and P 500 is up about 15 percent. A standard 60 40 portfolio would be about 7.8 percent. So you know based on the risk level, you know that's where you might come in at. Okay, so uh, I did not make up this headline, but I liked it. Soft landing in sight, the runway is wider and longer than expected. So coming into this year, could we have a soft landing? Could uh, Jerome Powell and the Fed give us a soft landing, managing inflation while slowing the economy without putting us into a recession? And you can see the bottom, the plane on the bottom left, mild slowdown, Consumer investment spending softens, but we keep kind of that positive growth. Hard landing, recession, sharp contraction in spending. Coming in this year, it was that foggy plane. Could it do it? So far, it's the, the Fed has done very well. Inflation has come down quite a bit. I'll have a slide on inflation in a moment. Um, uh, GDP is slowing. It is not negative. It's not uh, receding. So we're not on our way to a recession. Um, but this is the big news on when the Fed cuts rates and when the market will take off even more. As far as our investments, and Steve said, uh, you know, some, some themes work and some do not. So what I did is I kind of color coded these. The yellow themes, I'll say, were moderately successful. The green ones uh, did much better. And the red themes didn't work out as well as we had hoped. So, you know, I'll, I'll cover some of the, you know, the interesting ones. So cybersecurity, you know, our CrowdStrike position has done very well. Uh, you know, it, part of it's due to cybersecurity, but part of it is uh, our position was picked to join the S&P 500. So only three stocks made that move and we had one of them. Uh, so that stock did very well. As far as artificial intelligence, you know, our current holdings, Apple, Amazon, Google, they've done, they've done well, they went up. As far as picking every AI stock, Yes, we wish we had NVIDIA front and center. We don't. We hold it within our JTAC, uh, aggressive uh, you know, technology leaders, but we don't have a pure position in it. So, you know, yes, I wish we could catch everyone, but we, we do our best. Um, what we're going to go towards the, the latter half of this year is kind of what I'm going to call a second tier. And that means where can AI be applied that we can benefit? And, you know, I've heard, you know, so what businesses will take advantage of AI? And that's some of the stocks that we and ETFs that we'll identify. A um, couple of the red ones, clean energy has not done that well with the higher rates from the Fed and healthcare. You know, we, we've been in some healthcare. You know, I knew enough to stay away from the health insurance just because of the government reimbursement. But it's a it's a tricky business. And going into the uh, election, uh, you know, healthcare will be, I'm sure will be front and center with costs. Um, the, the hardest one with that is, you know, inflation can't be passed on to the consumer. A lot of times for healthcare, it's passed to the government. So the government just says, no, we won't reimburse that. And the stocks get crushed in the middle. 
Um, robotic process automation, we've had some picks there that have not done as well as I would have expected. So we're looking to find out for you know, ideas, you know, improvements there. Uh, big banks refinancing, it hasn't happened yet because the rates haven't come down. But you know, when we get to this refinancing period, every person that did a mortgage in the last couple of years is going to be refinancing. So, and, and the, the other yellow one I wanted to call out is S&P growth beyond the MAG-7. And you're going to see a slide where the MAG-7 is eating up more and more air in the space. It's just, it's a higher percentage of value than it ever has been before. Uh, at some point, it, the growth is going to have to occur beyond there, or these top stocks are, are going to come crashing back down. Uh, they're getting very expensive compared to peers around them. So uh, it's something that we'll closely monitor. Uh, as far as our starting lineup, I know you're familiar with a lot of the best of breed tech. Uh, added metas in there, JTech. Those are two new ones that we've kind of added as the best of breed. Um, as far as new in, new in 2020 or 2024 Q3, We'll add JGrow, which is uh, another JP Morgan growth model. And that's looking for AI beyond AI. So there's high growth stocks in there that aren't necessarily NVIDIA, Apple, Amazon, Google. And uh, one idea that, that Corey presented that we're going to add is an aggressive growth with income. So these are stocks with a good potential for growth, but they also pay, I, I want to say it's a, about a 3%. 2.9% overall yield. So some of you that are aggressive, but maybe want that income coming in as well, you're going to like, you're going to like the stocks that we have already selected in there. And then finally, uh, towards the, uh, as we move in, we'll do some ro bond rotation uh, from a USFR to some other ones that have a, a better duration as interest rates are expected to go down. And then we'll also do some uh, risk reduction as we go into the election volatility. Okay, I know that a lot of you have seen these slides and Steve has covered the story of the two Nevers. Well, the story's over and, um, and this will probably be the last time I'll cover this, but we've been in a negative yield curve for a long time now, which, which is, you know, 100% of the time, you know, predicts a recession. We're still there, but we're not in a recession. But his opposite never that he presented that has been occurred is we've never been a recession when the unemployment is below 4%. Well, it's at 4% now. So technically the two nevers have converged, but we're still not in a recession. So I just thought I'd point that out to close that out. Inflation. And, and this is uh, probably one of the most important topics uh, for our Fed and, and overall economy. Inflation continues to come down, but more slowly than expected. Housing and auto insurance are about 60 to 70% of inflation. So how does this affect you? If you are a homeowner that locked in your interest rate at 3%, you know, a couple years ago, that means that about your only effect, your inflation is really only, you know, one, one and a half percent tops. It, that's what it's down to. Shelter is is really still the driver and it's just coming down more slowly. Rent is coming down. And what's happened is people that have locked in this interest rate a couple of years ago, they're not looking to buy houses because they don't want to go pay a 7% interest rate. So therefore, there's less supply on the market. Therefore, house housing prices have continued to stay high. Uh, as the Fed reduces interest rates, we'll see that we should see the market start to move a little bit more. And then as far as auto insurance, this is crazy. Uh, it's been up 20 percent year over year. And if you're a small business owner and you have automobiles, uh, if you're the parent of a teenagers, you've seen your auto insurance go up quite a bit. If it's just you and your spouse, you know, maybe, you know, 20 percent increase. It doesn't seem like that much, but auto insurance, you know, have to believe it cannot continue to be growing at 20% year over year much longer. So we'll see where this goes. What is it caused by, you know, you know, part of it's more expensive to fix vehicles. Uh, a lot of times the way they're built, you know, 
I threw out there that, you know, a lot of distracted driving, you know, I don't know. But anyways, these are the two things that are driving auto or inflation the most. This graph looks a little bit crazy, but this is the unemployment rate against wage growth. So this has an inflation component to it. The light blue line is wage growth. So this would be something that would drive inflation. So if you look in the past, when unemployment's high, guess what? They don't have to raise wages to keep people in jobs. So wage growth goes down. When unemployment gets lower, then wage growth tends to go up. And then obviously during the COVID year, things were all crazy with unemployment and uh, recent. Well, what you can see is the wage growth has dropped to about 4% in 2024. So you can see these numbers continuing to go down, um, which is another reason why inflation should continue to do, uh, decline. And as far as the unemployment rate, it is also at 4%. And we'd expect this would go up a little bit more into 2025. I've seen some different projections that show it about 4.2%. But it's, it's, if you remember last time when I displayed this, you know, it's the battle of boomers are retiring while we have immigration coming in, both legal and illegal, kind of countering each one. So um, this is an example where if we didn't have the, you know, it's scary, but if we did not have the immigration coming in, there would be a lot more job openings out there. Um, so, so far that's kind of mitigating. I showed this last time, and this is the Fed dot chart. So the Fed has 19 voting members, and they plot what they think the Fed funds target rate is. And what I tried to show is the differential from last time. So originally, uh, or three months ago, they had uh, 75 basis points or three 25-point cuts happening in 2024. That has reduced down to one. So they, if you remember... Uh, Anchor Star Wealth said no cuts in 2024, and people were saying there's going to be six, and, and now we're down to you know one projected cut. So uh, whether there's one or there's zero, I, I'd say our prediction of zero was pretty good, as opposed to most people saying six. What what happened is it's getting pushed back into 2025 and 2026, and then in the longer run, we'll be at a more neutral uh, Fed funds rate. So that kind of shows you where we've been at so far this year. But you're thinking, where are we going to be? How's the rest of this year going to work out? It's an election year. And, and it, I don't know if it really seemed to me that it was an election year until we got to this debate last week. It's been, to me, one of the quieter election years. I don't know if it's just because Biden and Trump locked up their nomination so quick that we didn't hear much about it. But uh, until the debate last week, it, it just felt like I'm not even sure this is an election year. But let's see, what does the market do in election years? Because here we sit uh, and you can see that previously, when you look at 1950 to 2023, June, July and August are pretty good. Summer rallies are common in election years. Doesn't mean we have a guarantee it's going to happen. Uh, July's off to a good start. June was great. Um and then you can see September and October are when there's typically a decline. And then the markets are happy again once they know who has been selected as president for November and December. So, uh, you know, we have a 15 percent gain halfway through the year. If you would have told me at the end of the year we'd be up 15 percent overall, I'd say that's a great year. We still haven't seen the gains broaden out to what I'm going to say, the other 495 stocks or 490 stocks. We're seeing those, those top 10 stocks really drive forward. So there's an opportunity of you know, really two different things that can happen. I mean, most likely. Either it broadens out to the rest and the overall market gains accordingly, or we could see some of these top stocks start to slow significantly. I mean, NVIDIA can't drive the entire economy by itself. Um, so we're going to have to see some change there. So we'll see where this goes. More on the election. You know, 
the top graph shows the overall stock market, you know, kind of an average performance in an election year reaching 7.3. And then the bottom one shows it in a, uh, as far as a new president. So, uh, you know, there's still a sweet spot for seasonality as far as the increase. So you can see both of them going up 7.3%, 12.2. Everything's, you know, good news. Fourth year of a new, of fourth year of a new president. That's what we're in. Uh, Joe Biden, this is his first term. He is a new president. May not seem like that, but he is. So um, a, another thing with these presidents that are running, the market can feel a little bit safer right now because we know both of these presidents. They both have been there. Uh, we don't have a brand new one yet. You know, we don't know what's going to what's going to happen over the next few months. But uh, there is some knowledge there. I still did put down we should expect some volatility during August through October going into elections. Um, every year, the, you know, the market tends to have these times when it drops five or ten percent. Uh, we did get about a 5% drop back in April uh, that you can see on the graphs. But, you know, will this continue on a straight line up? That would be doubtful. And I, I would never, never predict that. So just want to, you know, let everyone know that we're going to reduce risk a little bit. And we're always going to look for excellence on sale. With high... I put higher than normal safe returns, 5.39% on USFR. You know, that's a great return on money market safe, safe, you know, safe uh, investments. However, you know, 5.39% sounds great, but when the market goes up 15%, is it really great? Uh, you know, it, you know, and it depends on the, you know, kind of your risk tolerance, how you want to sit. Um, it's certainly better than zero or 0.5% or doing crazy things like that. But overall, what we're seeing is money market dollars over $6 trillion sitting there in these safe inv uh, investments. What can happen is as the Fed lowers the rates and this thing goes from 5.39 down to four, or three and a half, people might say, that's not enough return on my dollars. I'd like to invest it a little more aggressively. And this will shift back to a more of a normal amount. You can see from January 11 through January of 2020 there, it was right around $3 trillion. It's doubled over $6 trillion. Part of this is also combined by re retiring baby boomers, this being a normal investment in their portfolio as far as within our models and a lot of other people's models. So we would expect this to go up somewhat but it's really kind of shifted more than expected. So talked a little bit about the MAG-7 and how uh, crazy expensive and where these stocks have went. Um, and you can see uh, in the graph on the left, uh, the, the green line is the MAG-7. And if you were just invested in the MAG-7, if that was your only investment, I mean, up 40%, down 40%, up 76%, up 33%. And, and it's not like these are small companies. These are huge companies. But what's scary is it's 61% of the 2024 returns. It was 63% of last year's returns. So a few stocks are driving the market higher. And you can see the rest is in the, the blue. So the rest of the, the, the non-MAG7 in the S&P 500 is that blue line. Fortunately, our, our company, we invest aggressively, so we are heavily tied to them. I, I'm very thankful for that, that we did not go to safety back in 2022 when they dropped 40%. Uh, we stayed aggressive with our investing, and it's paid off handsomely. But there's still a point when you say in the, in the, the graph in the upper right, it's 37% of the market capitalization of the S&P 500. So if you just buy the S&P 500, you're getting 37% of those top seven stocks. If you buy an equal weight, then you're getting a much smaller percentage. There has to be an expectation that this is going to grow out to the rest of the S&P 500, or I put at least the top 100 biggest companies. So that's something that we'll continue to explore as far as how we invest to pick up those gains. 
And here's the thing. If the market goes down, and there will be times when it goes down, the rest of those stocks are less likely to decline because they have not you know, went up as much. So there'll be some opportunity there. So I just put down expectation forecast. The meteoric growth of the MAG-7 will slow. And then here's to our forecast. And, and I know uh, Joel has his document set out there and you'll, you'll be able to read that in detail. But um, the Fed's done a good job. You know, Jerome Powell, I put caution, work in progress. He, he's doing a good job. The Fed's been stable. Rates have continued steady. Um, the CPI is, has declined. So we're, we're seeing that happen. GDP is slowing, which is expected, has not went negative. Uh, the returns continue to be driven by those mag seven. Um, as far as uh, second quarter, this quote just came out yesterday. The Fed has made quite a bit of progress on inflation, but needs more confidence before cutting, before cutting rates. So, you know, it's Powell kind of saying, yeah, we're doing, we're doing pretty good, but I'm going to do the trust, but verify. I'm not going to totally trust the numbers yet. I, I need some more verification, but we expect that. Um, I have noticed there has been some squeeze on the lower middle incomes as far as defaults, not defaults as much in mortgages, but we're seeing more defaults in credit cards and auto loans. So there, there is some defaults spiking up there. So that's some, that shows that it, the, the economy is slowing and the, especially the lower middle class are getting squeezed. Um, as far as our forecast, Shift in monetary policy, one rate forecast by the market. Um, you know, we currently are going to say no rate cuts, but, you know, maybe one in December. I mean, I know some people have said as early as September is possible, but um, it gets tricky around elections, although it should not be impacted by that. Uh, I've seen GDP forecast down to 1 to 1 1.7%, which is below the normal 2%. So still growing, but more slowly. Uh you know, while it's been a great first half of the year, you don't pay us to just go to cash and sit the rest of the year and say, yep, it was great. You know, we're going to continue to ag uh, invest aggressively where we think it makes sense. Um, look for the volatility dips in summer and, and try to buy some things on sale. Uh, over on the right, you can see Jerome Powell giving us when he gives us that thumbs up, we're going to get the advance to go. The rates are going to go down and the market should go higher. That's the expectation. I made this slide up. Uh, you know, we got the election in the upper left. We got Powell. We want to be like that cheetah. We want to be fast and nimble. And we're chasing this bear possible, you know, bear when the market sells off. But I put down, we honestly don't really want to catch the bear. So, so we want to uh, invest, invest and pay attention. And if we get some volatility, buy. But we don't want to catch a bear here, but we the, just kind of that's our goal. So with that, uh, actually, let me just hit on um, Joel's update here. We got it, just a piece of it here, but you'll get the full report. One thing I love that Joel put in is to talk a lot about uh, our national debt. And it is crazy high. Our national debt, it continues to grow. Um, you know, interest rates being higher doesn't help because, you know, when we have low interest rates, guess what? You know, as the, the government pays less interest on that debt. Um, if, if this was our family and we had all this debt, you know, uh, the spouses would get together and say, hey, we need to cut back. We need to take some steps. However, the government, you know, both Republicans and Democrats continue to spend a lot, uh, you know. Uh, it's not any fun to attack this national debt. There are some things that we can do. Um, we're counting on growth to eventually be able to pay it down. But this is a concern. I don't know if this will come up much in the elections because nobody really wants to deal with it. It's, it's, it's the problem that it's the elephant in the living room where people would just be like, oh, I want to fix it, but I'm going to be very unpopular with the voters if I cut things they expect. So um, I think Joel did a great job of covering that. So please read that. And with that, I will turn it over to questions.
All right. Thanks, Mike, for uh, reviewing that for everybody. It's a great presentation, a lot of information in there. So uh, great charts. If you need to go back again, it'll be out on replay. If you need to go back and really kind of digest a uh, chart, because we throw a lot of information at you uh, for sure. Um, I do have the chat room open, so please throw in some questions there. We did have one question come in. It came in privately. Um, but the question was, do you take international investors? Uh, with the in the in the anchor star wealth, and I said, well, we're entirely reliant on the answer. Is we're entirely reliant on whether Schwab accepts them, uh, international inve investors, and we do have one. Um, they have a an approved country list. Uh, I know Taiwan's on it because that's our one uh, one client that we have that's an inter international account. Um, but if they're living in the U.S., working in the U.S., that's a different story. We can uh, take folks that have a, a green card. Uh, because clients as well uh, while they're here and the social security number and all that. So uh, that's one question that came in. Was hoping during uh, that that there would be another question. So I guess last chance for the crew out there for, for a question. Hey, Steve, I'll just add in since someone asked about international yeah. and I thought they were going to ask about international positions. And right now, the U.S. market accounts for 64% of the international market cap. And the J.P. Morgan presentation I was at said that really should be more like 50%. Like the U.S. is where everyone's investing. We know there's a discount to invest internationally, but even that, that's another opportunity, uh, you know, international investing. So anyways. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a great point. And one of the things that I usually do when we uh, we review a lot of 401ks and manage those for folks, and again, it's a, it's a different type of management because people have to send them their statements normally, and we have to review them and send back the allocation difference. But I mean, it, in the past 20 years, if you've had any exposure to international, largely that has lagged the U.S. significantly. So it's kind of like costing your money there, costing yourself money there. And I honestly don't see that changing uh, anytime soon. Uh, you know, as a company, we've broadened out into India uh, just a little bit. For the, but for the most part, our international exposure is, is pretty small and not looking for that to change anytime soon. Correct. All right, everybody. Well, thanks again for listening in. If you're here real time, uh, I know your time is precious. So thanks for spending 40 minutes with us. And for those who catch us on replay, same sort of thing. Uh, we'll have this out tonight. But I want everybody to new, enjoy their holiday tomorrow. Hopefully you can get some time off, spend it with family and friends. And because uh, that's what it's all about. And with that, we will catch you guys next time. You have a good one. Bye. Sure.